Cool. Okay, so welcome, Sandy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Super excited to be having a chat with you. How's things? Great, thank you. A bit wet here in Wellington today, though. Pretty miserable, but I'm good. Great. Yeah, pouring down here in Christchurch as well. It's certainly winter has finally hit, I think. Yeah, sure has. Very good. So we're just going to have a bit of a chat about Centre Pass today, which is awesome to have you on board. But before we kind of delve into that, we'd love to hear a bit about your journey. So how you started out playing and, you know, your journey through through that um, life and then into your coaching life as well. Yeah, I'll try and make that short. <laughs> <laughs> so I so started playing netball when I was seven. Uh, made my first rep team. I was a bit of a late starter at 16, playing a bit of tennis or lots of tennis before that and lots of netball. Uh, came to Wellington in the early 80s and got hooked into the netball scene here uh, as a player. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of when I started my journey up the ranks, if you like, with um, started in St Mary's Old Girls B team, then made the A team the next year, played for the Wellington under-21s, made the New Zealand under-20 team, made the Silver Ferns, as, or the Wellington team, in my second year here, then made the Ferns when I was 22 and moved to Hamilton, uh, moved around the country a bit over the years, uh, and or playing, playing, mm -hmm. and the coaching, mm -hmm. as far as coaching goes, pretty much started when I came to Wellington in the early 80s for club, coached a club team, nice. and after four years here, moved to Hamilton, where um, a New Zealand, a fellow New Zealand trialist, Kristen Coates, she was playing for a club up there, Hamilton Old Girls. So during some trial times, uh, uh, silver fern trials, um, you yeah, got to know Kristen quite well, and we played similar positions. So when I moved to uh, Hamilton, she said, "I'll come and play for my club." So mm. I said, "Fab, I'll come and play for your club." So I arrived to come and play for the club. She was coaching at that stage. Um, well, she proceeded to have a baby that year, so I ended up coaching. So, <laughs> so have been coaching pretty much since I was what eighteen, and picked up. Well, actually, I was a player coach, as a number of us were back in those mm -hmm. days um, yep. of a Prem One club team. And in, in between then and now, uh, dabbled in schools and rep, age group rep teams, and had three um, incredible years with the Pulse with Yvette um, the last three years so been doing it a while. <laughs> That's amazing some incredible um, memories in there then so many amazing highlights as well what what are some of the yeah top memories that stick out from either playing or, or coaching? You're right and and they're all different like mm. I've still got really vivid memories of playing as a seven year old you know between seven and thirteen in Toko, Tokamaru Bay, up on the East Coast, and I just loved my netball up there, and I remember the uniforms that I had, and you know, when you go from year six to year um, seven, or standard four to form one, you know, you get the flash uniforms, and yeah. you know, my uniform was all set out on Wednesday, Wednesday <laughs> on my bed, because I was so looking forward to it. Um, oh. Those memories are really strong, and then I went to a boarding school, and the best thing about boarding school was all well, weather trips away for netball. <laughs> <laughs> Getting up, love the mornings, and you jump on the Nimmons bus to go down to one of the schools that we were playing. And to be honest, I can't remember too much about the netball at that stage. I do remember being a bit, um, one memorable game was against a rival rival team, and we lost by one, and my parents had come to watch, uh, and I felt totally ripped off mm. and blamed someone for the whistle on the side. <laughs> I mean, that's really clear. Um, you know, the camaraderie in club netball is still really special. You know, the fun that you have there. Mm. Um, again, some memorable on-court uh, matches there, you know, winning the final by one. Um, and, and then, of course, the thrill of playing for the, uh, for the or with the silver fern. Mm. Um, yeah, probably 87, that was my first world tournament. I played in three. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure it would have been better had it have gone three, two, one, but in my case, it went one, two, three. So, uh, 
so eighty seven was was it was a great year, but there were you know lots of other lots of other highlights and you know for different reasons as well you know mm. different reasons so it's not just um you know those pinnacle events but there's been many highlights in, in, in between in between times as well yeah i bet it's so hard to narrow it down isn't it because every week has its own highlights doesn't it when you're involved with netball but so relate to that that memory of you know having your uniform laid out you sort of wanted to wear it all week long and never yeah. take it off when you got home on a saturday so yeah it's pretty special what was that moment like when you first stepped on the court for the Silver Ferns? That was in 1985, uh, and I just that was my first year in the team. And wow. we went to the Australian Games in Australia, obviously, and we played in Melbourne. And I can't actually remember the name of the venue, but I do remember it had well, it seemed like a really, really, really big tin shed yeah. um, in January. Pretty sure it was January, maybe early February. And the, t- <laughs> the temperature inside the stadium was about 41 degrees. Oh. And we were downstairs getting ready for the game. I don't actually know if it was my first game to remember. My first game, I just remember passing. If I catch it and pass it to <laughs> mates, can't go wrong. But um, we were downstairs and Lois knew it was the coach at the time. And she said, now look, you lot, it's 41 degrees up there. We know it's hot. All right, we know it's hot. This is going on about this, and she said, um, "But the air is moving, okay? So <laughs> just, you know, be prepared." Yeah. And old Ditsy here, we go upstairs into the stadium, and the first thing I was saying was, "Hey, it's hot!" <laughs> Lois just about jumped down my throat. Um, so I was playing centre though there, and um, um. And it was a successful tournament, I might add. So we drew with Australia in the prelim round and then we beat them in the final. So, nice. And I was playing um, opposite Jill McIntosh. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Gosh, I cannot even imagine playing in that heat. It's incredible, especially coming from, you know, the cold winters that we have here and what we're used to. So what a well, shock to the system. Trained like building up. We had trained in the summer, so and mm. I actually quite like the heat, so it didn't worry me too much. But um, yes, that was my first experience, and it was a a good winning one too. Oh, fantastic! Um, so you mentioned um, obviously Lois there. Are there other coaches or you know um, Lois herself that sort of stick in your mind for um, being able to really motivate and inspire and you know build your confidence? What what did those coaches do to um, to do that for you? I think they all, you know, they all did, and I think the the, uh, the I don't know what would you say the uh, uh, yeah their ability to yeah, instill confidence, and you know I think mm. that comes from not so much one on one that is part of it, but mm. it's around. Uh, really purposeful trainings, um, knowing your players, who they are, and what you know what drives them, and letting us be ourselves. Mm-hmm. Putting in a bit of structure and a framework from which we can, um, from which we can I don't know, refer back to, I guess, but yeah. still play our game. I think was. Um, really important and I think and from my memory you know most of them did that so I think that that was the key and set high expectations too I think that's really yeah. important like mm. keeping stretching you um letting you suffer you know not stepping in too much just just I think it's through that that you see growth so mm. they were good at that as well yeah that's awesome and when you feel that growth yourself as a player there's nothing more and um, that builds your confidence, is it, when you're seeing your own um, levels move up. So, yeah, that's really cool. Nice. So today we're going to talk a little bit about Centre Pass for our community coaches and share some some tips and some wisdom. So just um, to set the scene a little bit, what would you say some of the um, key kind of attacking and defensive Centre Pass strategies or tactics might be? Well, we could go into that for hours and you need diagrams and you need to walk through it and discuss it. Uh, 
I think for any kind of, well, I suppose this is a, a, a tactic in a way, you know, Senior Pass Attack, for example, what is your purpose? What is the purpose of Senior Pass Attack? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is to get the ball from the centre to your shooters. So how are you going to do that? Um, one trap that I think players fall into is lack of communication. When I say players, it's more around the goal attack wing attack. Uh, yeah, goal attack wing attack, isn't it, really? So one of the... You've got to come forward over the line because you've got to receive it in the, in the centre third. So if you both come over and you both end up running towards the centre and the centre makes the decision... Um, You've kind of got three players in the light. You know, you're all bunched up. What you want to do, I, um, I don't know if it's common knowledge out there, but um, we kind of talk about first phase, second phase. Mm. So first phase, the first phase is the first phase receiver. So um, one very simple um, setup would be what we call one over. So you really want one first, one player, which is likely to be the wing attack going over. Sure. But you don't want your goal attack just having a little holiday, you know, <laughs> back because you want to create a nice driving second phase, which is sort of heading towards the goal circle. So if that's clear, that means the it might be the wing attack. Um really works hard to get over the first phase and the goal attack might draw her goal defence over the line saying come with me and just and then when the wing attack gets it the goal attack can drive towards the circle leads and receive the second phase so you know that's one really simple really simple um, tactic you could use some might say um, you might be doing a one over, but there's two players that go back on the wing attack. So the wing attack might keep the centre and the wing defence busy, pretend to go over, um, keep them active, and the goal attack might be the better one because they've only got one defender on here. Mm. So if the goal attack comes over, then the wing attack can get that lovely drive towards the um, circle edge, which is what you're what you're after. Perfect. So that's one. Um, inside out is another one. So the whole idea, well, normally what will happen is that the wing defence and the goal defence will get on the inside of the wing attack and the goal attack and sort of try and push them wide. So preparing early is really important for these kind of things. Um, this centre pass attack as well. Mm. So the wing attack might say, I'm going to get the inside. So she gets towards the line and gets the um, wing defence sort of on the sideline side of her. Mm -hmm. And the goal attack goes out to get the first phase. And because the wing attack has kept the wing defence towards the sideline, she's got that lovely inside drive to the circle edge. Mm. So that's what you're looking at. So you can do all sorts of things. Brilliant. Right. That's the theory behind it. Love it. So you can have a bit of a play around with it and depending on what the scenario is um, defensively, adjust, you know, based on a whole lot of tools that you might have. Yeah, and that's a whole, you know, that's a day's worth of <laughs> Exactly. But when you go back to what are you trying to do, you're trying to get a good first phase option for your centre to pass to, and then you want a, a um, another option uh, for second phase where you get that lovely drive towards this, if you can. That's mm. what you're aiming for. And you can set up... Um, you can use the back people, you can use the wing defence and the goal defence. And one tactic around that might be an overload where the wing attack and the goal attack go over to an outside channel. And so 
there's all this space, say if it's in the left hand channel, there's all this space in the middle channel and all this space in the right hand channel. So you would get your wing defence to get the first phase pass. So they would come drive forward um, towards the attacking end, receive the pass, and then the goal attack or the wing attack has all that lovely space to drive into. Mm. Or the centre, if she's really nippy, which they always are, um, <laughs> might be able to get that nice drive towards the circle edge. So you can have a play around with that as well. Mm. Oh, I love that one. That's really cool. Um, and what about on defence? What sort of centre pass defence look like for our, our wing Ds and our goldies and our centre? Wing Ds and goldies. Okay, so what's the purpose? What are we what are we trying to do defence? Mm -hmm. So the attacks, they're trying to get the ball down to their shooters. So probably the first defensive thing that you're trying to do is get the ball. Um, and secondly make life really, really difficult for your um, opponents, your, your attackers that you're defending. So, so defensive options, uh, the wing attack is usually the first phase guru. They are the ones that um, are expected to run that forward line and receive that first phase. So you could double up on the wing attack so the center goes back and stops um helps or works with the wing defense to stop the wing attack getting out mm -hmm. and leave the goal defense to work hard on the goal attack and the aim is to get ball and the best ball to get is probably forcing them high and wide and making a diagonal so that mm -hmm. you can cut that ball off so that's one option that's called what we call I call that the two on a two on one. Mm -hmm. um, a one on one could be the centre um, goes up on the her opponent, the opposition centre. She would probably probably angle herself a little bit more towards the wing attack to try and lift the ball. To get the ball lifted, so that the wing defence, or when the wing attack comes out, the wing defence um, has got more chance of getting it if the ball's been made to go over mm. a lifted ball. So the, the centre can can help uh, lift that ball for the wing defence, and the goal defence better do a really good job on the. Uh, <laughs> and when I say do a good job, you want to keep them away from. You want to push them to the sideline if you can. Mm. It really limits your, your options. You can really, um, if a, a goal attack or a wing attack receives the ball really wide, you can really cut off lots of options there. So so the one-on-one is another, um, another, another option. And another option is, it's, fairly common is called the war or uh, three over some people call it uh, some yeah, netballers call it three over and the whole idea is that the centre and the wing defence and the goal defence form uh, as soon as the whistle goes the wing defence and the goal defence get over the line the centre's already back there as well. So there's a three-person uh, wall there. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to stop that middle channel yep. and make your um, goal attack and wing attack go wide again. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good tactic. What I've talked about just then is... Um, pretty much first phase defence, if you like, it's mm -hmm. first phase. So it's really important that should the goal attack or wing attack um, get the ball, that that's okay, but what's your job? Stop them getting to circle edge. So then you've got to sort of set up so that you 
you make life really difficult for them to get to circle edge while still seeing the ball because you're still wanting to get the ball. Mm. Nice. The relentless job of a defender. Yeah, I've only just talked about the, um, you know, the front line, if you like. Yes. So for centre pass defence, there's still a big responsibility on your wing attack, your team's wing attack and goal attack to stay engaged mm. and um, and stick with uh, the wing defence and the goal defence from the, the opposition as well. So they still have to do a lot of work and there's some tactics for them as well. They might do a rush, which means that they get down really quickly um, in front of the wing defence and goal defence to stop them getting a drive to the um, transverse line. Um, or they might just stick one-on-one. -on -one, or, yeah, there's lots of other options from there. But you've got to do the work. You know, Everybody's got to do the work. So true. Nothing worse than all that great defence from the other end happening and then the wing D or goal D just whips up and gets a nice easy pass. <laughs> The goal attack and the wing attack are just like what <laughs> on holiday. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so you know, again, just think about what what it is you're trying to achieve, and um, um, and there's lots of oh, lots of ideas that you can come up with, yeah. and players can come up with them too on on how best to either get ball on defence or make life really difficult, or to um, get an easy uh, easy direct route towards the circle edge to feed your shooters. Yeah, great to incorporate the, the players' ideas as well. And do you sort of look at the players' strengths a little bit as well around, you know, what they're really good at and yeah. enhancing that? Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, you can look at the opposition as well. And if you've got a team that does a really good wall, mm. you might So you wouldn't want to set up, if you're playing against a team that does a really good wall, set up right in the middle channel, unless you're exceptionally dynamic <laughs> and um, fantastic changes of direction and good communication and early preparation. So um, I, I, think, I think at community level, you, you give all these things a go. Mm. Give, give them a go and... Um, uh, yeah, so maybe on attack, if, yeah, as I say, if it's a team that does a good wall, you might do an overload. Um, if, if you've got a really good um, dynamic wing attack, then you'd probably, on attack, you'd probably put them on a two on, you know, put, a, put two back on. Mm. So there's heaps of things to think about. Yeah, some really cool tips for our coaches there, though, and some good places to start. So if our coaches are, um, you know, taking this into their training sessions, obviously there's sort of some fundamental skills they're trying to develop so that they can, you know, use these strategies, and then there's the strategies themselves. How would you go about sort of planning a training that incorporates um, incorporates these things? I think, uh, are you talking about... Um how to put these plays, if you like, into practice. Yeah, exactly. Well, it is worth, worth walking through them. You know, I mean, in a practice, I like practices where there's heaps of work on fundamental movement skills, uh, heaps of work on uh, skill breakdown, like, say, getting free before you even incorporate it into, um, into the, the play or the tactic. Yes. So, so I think when you are um, trying these plays, you really do need to make sure that people are, or the players are really clear on what it's called, mm -hmm. what the purpose of it is, and then you can just walk through it and then run through it and then slowly build up the intensity uh, and then... Be patient when it comes to, comes to gameplay initially whilst they try these things out and there will be lots of mistakes made and it's okay. Um, and then you go back and um, yeah, keep revising it. But just take it slow to start with. I mean, it, 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 
a skill you can do it individually, you can you know you execute it individually, but a tactic is I think it's a, a military term that comes around or comes from um, yeah a, a plan that everybody knows their purpose in the plan and you're able to execute it without being you know shot or you know, <laughs> terrible doesn't it? But um, yeah, so everybody you've got to take the time so that everybody knows what what. What the purpose of what you're trying to achieve and what your role in it is. Yeah. yeah, perfect. That makes sense. So obviously, when the players are on court and they're you know moving through um, the game, you obviously can't necessarily chat with them until the quarter break. So how do we enable them to be able to decide which particular you know tactical strategy they might use at a different time? And if you know things change on the court, how do we get them to adapt to that and you know, pull a new tool out of the um, out of the kit to use for that particular moment. Mm, still trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the challenge, isn't mm-hmm. it? That's the challenge, and it does take time. Uh, the, uh, I don't think there's any point, coaches. I've done it before. I'll admit, telling the players, telling the players to do something, <laughs> and. They're all nodding, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you go away and you think, <laughs> we haven't even done this. I don't even know, you know. Um, so it's just a matter of, oh, you know, you, you, you've got to build it up. If you go on with a game plan, then you'd, you'd ex- that could be a bit frustrating when you've, say, analysed your opposition and you've got a couple of uh, tactics that you want to um, apply. Then... And they don't. That would be a little bit annoying. So, I think you've really got to see, look, and say, "Is this a good option?" But the players aren't executing it well. Mm. Or, oh dear, yeah, no, they've got it. Given it an honest, um, honest go, deep as we might need to change it. And so, you do need to have a little change up your sleeve. Mm. Uh, and that would come at the break because it's. I mean, you probably could yell out some orders. Um, during the game, and it might resonate, but again, they've got to know exactly what it is that it is that, that you're asking them to do. Mm. So, I think my advice is um, yes, take your time, make sure the players, even before they take the court, understand the plays that you have, and and the whole idea that as in time they can adapt. You know, they can call it on yes. the or you might you might have a really vocal. Um, wing attack that loves calling that, you know, um, has a really good sense of, of what is needed. So they might make the call. Uh, so those are the things that you figure out as you, as you, as you develop. Yeah, sure. And it takes time to sort of get them to that place. Yeah. Yep. yep. Awesome. Hey, so um, just to, there's been some amazing, um, amazing ideas and, and answers in there and I think really helpful for our coaches. One question that we always love to ask at the end of these um, little chats is um, if there's one thing that you knew about coaching now that you wish you had known at the start, what would that one thing be? Probably that patience mm. that I'm talking about. It's all all good. You know, it's um, uh, the reality of training for community coaches mm. is what? One 90 minute session a week, maybe mm. a couple. So, yeah. <laughs> so it pays to be really well organized and planned, and you determine what learning outcomes that you're wanting in that particular training. Uh, but you're not going to get through, <laughs> you, know, you don't get through a heck of a lot. So, you've got to be patient. Uh, that would be that was, I think, back in the early days, I was a bit. Why can't they do this? You know, and I'd drum it in and <laughs> keep doing this until you've got it, you know, and there's so many other aspects of netball that we could have focused on and benefited from, but kept revisiting what it was that a little bit frustrating as a coach. So yeah, be well planned, maximize the time you've got. Uh, the, the players will develop in their own time and you just do your best uh, in supporting them 
over time. Yep. <laughs> Don't expect miracles in the first <laughs> couple of games. Oh, that is really, really great advice, Sandy. Thank you. And some really wonderful tips on there. I'm sure there's going to be lots of coaches excited to get out and give some of those things a go. So thank you so much for your time today. Really, really appreciate um, you jumping on to do this with us and all the best for your season. Yep, thanks. Good to so, see you too. You, you too. Bye.